I've always hated shopping for furniture. Grocery shopping? They've got cake, cheese, and beer. Sounds perfect to me. Clothes shopping? Sure, I'll pick up some new jeans, that's a fine Saturday afternoon. But shopping for household items, pushing through the crowds of broke college students and bickering couples on the hunt for coffee tables and TV stands, all 20-page instruction books, a dozen wooden puzzle pieces, and tiny little screws that disappear into your carpet the second you take them out of the package, that's my own personal hell. So when my wife Brenda, the love of my life, my light in the darkest of times, asked me to go to Ikea with her to pick up the Glossstad sofa she found online, plus a few other essentials for the new house, I was reluctant to say the least. But love won out, and I just couldn't say no to those eyes. Or the promise that we'd pick up my favorite takeout on the way home. It would be a quick trip. We run in, we grab the sofa, and maybe a high-list shelving unit for her office, and we head back out. One hour tops. Well, some mad god of chaos and cheap furniture must have turned his hateful eye on me. I've been walking for hours, and nothing has changed. I knew Ikea was big, but this seems impossible. It's like the store never ends. I kept calling out her name, Brenda, but there's no response. Just my own voice bouncing off the flat white surface and rows of muskin wardrobes. I was such a jerk, I always do that, get swept up in the stress when we go furniture shopping. I told myself I wouldn't do it this time, but like clockwork, I got overwhelmed by the vast aisles, the myriad of options, and the hard to pronounce names. I was impatient. I told her to go look at throw pillows on her own because I was sick of getting sidetracked. She loved throw pillows. No, no, I, I can't let myself do that, it hasn't been that long. She's gotta be here somewhere. I, I can't let the last time we spoke be a fight about living room decor. Day two. So, it's my second day lost in Ikea. I can't believe I just wrote that. Also, I'm not entirely sure how many days it's been. There's no windows here. I, I can see when the sun's up and when it's down. The lights turn off sometimes, and I think that's meant to indicate night, but I really can't be sure. The clock on my phone is stuck at 3.22 p.m., the exact time we entered the store. I guess I should say I've slept once since being here. Managed to camp out on a Jisheim futon mattress. It wasn't the most comfortable, but I've definitely had worse. This place reminds me of the island of the Lotus Eaters in the Odyssey. I can't tell how much time is passing. Days and nights don't really exist here. Speaking of eating, I wish I had some food right about now. Brenda always has granola bars in her purse, and she's ready for anything. I've always admired that about her. I had a piece of gum in my pocket, but I think it lost its flavor ages ago. Nothing to eat, no one to talk to. I haven't seen an employee, another customer, not a single living soul. I don't have any signal, but my phone still has battery, and my step counter app says I've walked 30 miles. 30. Miles. And still not one friendly face, no exit sign. I just had the most horrible thought as I sit here on this pile of stones and scribbling in this notebook. What if I'm dead? What if I died on the store floor, keeled over from a heart attack or a stroke or something, and this is my eternal resting place? I, I know I wasn't perfect. I, I could have done more charity work, volunteered at soup kitchens, and helped more old ladies cross the street, but I didn't think I'd wind up in hell. The philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre once wrote, Hell is other people, but I'd like to respectfully disagree with Monsieur Sartre. Hell is an endless vacant Ikea. Day three. So it turns out I am not alone here. Not exactly. I still haven't seen another human being, but I did see something else. While I was trying to sleep, nestled in a makeshift bed of Shardar cushion covers and kept awake by the gnawing growl of my empty stomach, I heard a shuffling sound several feet away. Footsteps. I sat up, eyes darting around for the source of the sound. Could it be Brenda? Or some other hapless soul sucked into this prison with me? I spotted the silhouette of a person wearing an IKEA employee uniform, that unmistakable bright yellow shirt, a beacon of hope. Then it turned around, and I realized this was no ordinary salesperson. Their face was smooth, featureless, like an egg. If an egg was the size of a human head and perched on top of a seven-foot frame. Once I noticed its face, or lack thereof, I took in the rest of the creature's nightmarish form. Its proportions were all off. Short, stubby legs beneath a distended torso that stretched into long, long arms that dragged along the ground as it walked. Its hands were massive, with tapered fingers perfect for grabbing anyone who gets too close. Well, there was no way in hell I was falling asleep with that thing roaming around. So I got moving, and I tried to sneak my way past it. I thought it was clear when suddenly... Excuse me, sir. 
A voice came from the direction of the monster, even though it had no mouth to speak with. The store is closed. You need to vacate the premises. It spoke in a pleasant tone, polite, a true customer service voice. But when I turned, it was ripping its way through the maze of furniture toward me like it wanted to tear me limb from limb. I, I haven't done much running since my high school track and field days, but I turned and booked it as fast as I could. It didn't matter that it was dark, it didn't matter that I could trip at any second and land face first on a lamp or a sharp corner of a table. I had to get as far away from that thing as possible before I found out firsthand what exactly it did to trespassers. But my stamina isn't what it used to be, and I could feel exhaustion catching up to me. I could hear the thundering of the creature's footsteps as it gave chase, and I knew my heart couldn't keep this up much longer. So I did what I used to do when I was a kid and the big neighbor boys tried to beat the crap out of me on my walk home. I hid. I yanked open the doors to a wardrobe and I stuffed myself in, holding the doors closed from the inside. I could hear a scrabbling sound against the door, the scraping and scratching of the staff monster trying to get at me through the wood. But thank the Swedes for their fine engineering, because that wood just would not give. After what felt like an eternity, the assault on the door stopped, and I could hear the creature shuffling away, off to another section of the massive store. I stayed there in the pitch dark for a long time, slowing my breathing down and trying to get my heart to climb back down from my throat. What was that thing? Did it live here? Where did its voice come from? How did it know I was here? The questions bounced around my mind and I knew I might never find the answers. I'd guessed before that this was no ordinary Ikea. The endless rows of aisles and total lack of any human beings had been a pretty good clue. But now I knew for sure. I had left my own world behind. As I drifted off to sleep, the wardrobe closing around me like a coffin, my drifting consciousness thoughts were of Brenda. Whether she was trapped in here too, and on the off chance she was, if those creatures would get to her before I could. After the lights turned back on and a new day began, I started my walk in search of one thing only, food. I'd felt the hunger getting to me before, but after my sprint away from the faceless monster, my body was nearly limp with exhaustion. I had to get some calories in me as soon as possible, or I might not have the strength to run for my life next time. It took a few hours of walking, but I eventually spotted what I was looking for. There's only one thing I've ever enjoyed about Ikea, and it's those beautiful little meatballs. As I rounded a corner past a stack of Van Slang plant stands, the heavenly aroma hit me, like the most welcome slap to the face in the world. There in front of me, bathed in the warm glow of the fluorescent lights, was the store restaurant, and in the center, a trough of meatballs. I could see the steam rising up from the little jewels of meat. I didn't care there was no chef present or anyone who could have made them. I ran to the food and I stuffed my face. Once my stomach was full of meatballs and my heart full of new hope, I examined my surroundings. There were snacks, Swedish snacks I could bring with me. I grabbed a clam bee canvas bag and began to fill it with whatever I could grab. Cans of cider, jars of lingonberry jam and mustard, boxes of muesli, and bags of sour candy. Hell, I even grabbed some of the salty licorice. When food is this scarce, you don't look a gift horse in the mouth, even when its breath absolutely reeks. I'm not too sure where I'll sleep tonight. Don't want to be out in the open in case more of the staff find me. I try not to think too long about what might happen if they catch me next time. Maybe this is crazy, but I think I'll build a fort. I've got plenty of space for it and plenty of materials. I'll climb up to the top of a tall shelf and build a fort up there. Just have to hope I don't toss and turn too much in my sleep, or I might impale myself on the Tadagarp floor lamp. Day 4. Something incredible happened. I built my fort pretty close to the food area so I'd be able to access it again when I woke up. When the lights came on this morning, I saw someone helping themselves to the meatballs. They couldn't be staff because they've got nowhere to put the food even if they did. I took a closer look, and it was a person. An actual human person. Blonde woman in a blue sweater, loading up a bag with meatballs and other supplies just like I had the previous day. Hey! Called out to her and my voice felt strange. Rusty from not talking to anyone for days, I guess. She spun around, brandishing a fire axe. Right, she probably thought I was a staff member preparing to attack. I waved my arms to draw attention to my face, its eyes, nose, and mouth to make it clear I wasn't one of them. Sorry, sorry, I, I, I'm human. Hello? Her posture relaxed and she motioned for me to come down and speak to her. She introduced herself as Gloria, 
and explained that she was part of a community of other humans who had built a town in the checkout department. They had set up lights, beds, and most importantly, a gate to keep the staff out at night. How long have you been here? She asked me as we made our way towards checkouts together. Um, four days, I think. Her eyes widened, impressed. Most people usually don't make it through that many nights alone in here. The staff gets to them first. I shuddered at her words, and my thoughts turned once again to Brenda. I asked Gloria if she'd seen my wife at all, if she'd made it to the checkouts before me. She shook her head sadly. I came in with my sister, she told me. I haven't seen her since. And how long have you been in here? I asked. Gloria sighed and patted me on the back before speaking again. About a year? We were silent the rest of the walk, and by the time we reached the gates of checkouts, the lights were turning off for the night. Quick, we need to get inside. Gloria ushered me through the gates and followed behind. I was about to question her urgency when suddenly two faceless horrors lurched from the shadows. These two staff members were smaller than the ones I'd seen before, maybe four feet tall. They had the same long arms though, and they were reaching for us as they ran at the gate with primal speed. They threw their bodies against it, arms stretched towards me and Gloria. I screamed, jumping back. Gloria just watched them, stone-faced, waiting to see if this would be the night they actually broke through. After a while, the staff gave up and stumbled away, and I turned to take in the town of checkouts. I never thought I'd be so thrilled to see a collection of beds, lamps, and strangers. So many people, when I had worried I'd never seen another person again. There are around 40 people in total, though I haven't met everyone yet. Some folks were already sleeping when I got there, or keeping to themselves. The people I did meet nearly knocked me out with their kindness. They fed me, gave me water, a bed to sleep in, and a set of clean clothes one of them had fashioned out of sheets. They're not exactly stylish, but I'd take anything over the t-shirt and slacks I'd been sleeping and sweating in for days. I think I could be okay here, at least for a little while. At the very least, I'll get a good night's sleep for once. Day 11. So, I've been here at the checkouts for about a week now. And as bizarre as it feels to say this, I think I'm starting to settle in. Being around other people keeps me sane. Without that endless stretch of silence, there's less space for my mind to wander to the worst possibilities. John, one of the men here, had a phone charger with him, and I was able to get mine juiced up again. There's still no signal, but I had a few movies saved, and plenty of podcasts. I've been listening to a true crime show with some of the other people here, distracting ourselves from our own horror with the tale of somebody else's. We gather around, break into the rations we gather during the day, and even crack open some of the cider, while we listen to the silky voice narrator to take us through the story of bloody murder in a small town. It's kind of like summer camp, you know, without the nature, or the camp counselors, or the possibility of it ever ending. I've been asking around about Brenda, describing her, seeing if anyone spotted her, dead or alive. No one has. Gloria said that maybe Brenda never made it to where we are. Maybe she found the exit a long time ago and she's somewhere in the real world waiting for me to come back. That's what she thinks happened to her sister. It's coming up on the one year anniversary of her getting trapped inside, and she told me a secret. She's planning to try and escape. She spotted exit signs before and tracked them across the store. They seem to move around though shifting from one place to another when no one is watching. But she's figured out a pattern, and she's going to put it to the test. She's leaving next week, she wanted to tell me. She's a nice lady. I hope she makes it. Day 18. I woke up to the sounds of screaming. I rushed to the gate to see what was going on, and I saw John walking back from his supply run, cradling something in his arms. I couldn't make it out, but it was limp, pale, and dripping red. As he got closer, I saw a head of blonde hair, and my stomach dropped. Gloria. She had snuck out while everyone was asleep, didn't want to say goodbyes, and tried to find her way out. The staff had found her first. She was dead by the time John spotted her lying on the ground, a crimson smear across the tile signaling where the staff had dragged her. They packed her up into a box as a kind of burial. We all said a few words, and then two of the men took the box away. They had to put it somewhere far from the town, before it started to smell. I, I can't sleep. I can't stop thinking about Gloria and what happened to her. She seemed so sure, so confident. I've been looking through her things, what she had left by her bed. There isn't much, but there's a notebook like mine. She wrote her plan in here. Everything she noticed about the exit signs, the staff's behavioral patterns. I know it didn't work out for her, but there's something here. No one's spotted Brenda yet. I don't think she's in here with me. I think somehow she got free. She's out there waiting for me. I, I can't spend one more night here. I won't. I'm gonna go for it. I'm finding the exit tonight. 
Whether that's the door out of this place or the sweet release of death, I guess we'll just have to wait and see. Either way, I'll be out of this Scandinavian modernist hellhole once and for all. Now go check out SCP-3008 Trapped in Ikea and how to actually beat SCP-3008 The Infinite Ikea for more on the deadliest furniture store around.